Hello, Room 19. We are now on Chapter 3 of Blood on the River. I'm excited to read it with you. Chapter 3. The 5th of January was anchored in the Downs, but the winds continued contrary so long that we were forced to stay there some time, where we suffered great storms. Master George Percy, Observations. I rub my eyes and blink in the dim light of the tween deck. The ship pitches and rolls. I only know it's morning because of the bit of light that peeked in around the gun ports and the closed hatch. Because the roosters and hens down in the hold know, and they have started a racket, the tween deck reminds me of the root cellar at the orphanage. With its closed walls and ceiling, it is one long room running almost the length of the ship. Though one could hardly walk for the barrels and crates, that are taking up most of the room. At first, a few of the gentlemen hung pieces of cloth to make partitions since they thought they deserved some privacy. But those have all come down now in favor of setting up crates as card tables and barrels as sitting stools for their card games. The chickens are luckier than we are. Most days their crates are brought up on deck and they get fresh air to breathe. And the ship's cats and two dogs have the run of the place. So do the ship's 1,000 rats. We passengers are only allowed up to empty slop buckets or get the stew pots for our meals. Captain Newport says he doesn't want us getting in the sailor's way up on the deck. The deck is the top level of the sailboats, by the way. We are all seasick and bored. And we are going absolutely no place. We have had nothing but storms and wind blowing the wrong direction for weeks now. And we sit anchored in the cold, close enough to see England shores, but still trapped down in this hole of a tween deck, with the stench of urine and vomit and chicken dung. The gentlemen complain constantly. They want to sail back to shore and go home. Sir Edward Maria Wingfield is the most vocal in his complaints. He is furious at Captain S Smith who keeps reminding the gentlemen that they have signed seven-year contracts with the Virginia Company, and they can't quit this voyage. I can see why Master Wingfield wants to quit. Even living on the streets was better than this. Next to me, sleeping in our bed, a straw and canvas mattress thrown over some barrels, are Richard and snot-nosed nine-year-old James. James is servant to the gentleman George Percy, and afraid of everything. The men sleep two to a bed, but all three of us boys are crowded in together. There is a fourth boy, Nathaniel. He is older than I am, probably 13 or 14. It's a good thing he's on one of the other ships, or they'd have us sleeping four to a bed. I kick James to wake him. Give me some room, you little worm. James groans and rolls over. He leaves a smudge of snot on the canvas. I am not a worm. He whines sleepily. Everyone is waking up now. I hear yawning, grunting, men relieving themselves into slop buckets. James brings me my wash water. Now, per Master Percy is not a patient man. And James has to hop up to fetch water even before... He has a chance to rub the sleep out of his eyes. Richard is still sleeping. He is the soundest sleeper I have ever seen. Not even roosters crowing and men clomping right by his ear wake him. But Reverend Hunt is very ill with the seasickness, and he will need help. I jostle Richard hard. He groans, but doesn't open his eyes. Fine, I think. Let him get a lecture on slothfulness from Reverend Hunt. James and Richard have become good friends to each other, even though James is a gentleman's son and Richard is a commoner. They are not my friends, though. I have kept my distance from them and from everyone else on board the Susan Constant. Instead of trying to decipher which of the men are to be trusted and which are not, I have made it simple for myself. Trust no one. It is a philosophy that worked for me in the poorhouse, on the streets of London, and at the orphanage. I see no reason to change. Captain Smith has not beat me yet. He does not seem inclined to, 
but you never can tell. There is not much required of me aboard ship, just to bring him his wash water in the morning and empty the slop buckets we all use. There is not much for any of us to do. That is why there is so much time for the bubbling up of discontent. And today is the day it boils over. I've had... I have had enough, Master Wingfield announces. The food is monotonous and salty. The commoners stink, and the storms will not cease. We will sail back to London at once. Who is with me? I, several of the gentlemen call out. I means yes, by the way. We are with you. We're ready to turn back. Captain Smith stands and addresses them. Are you all cowards, he demands. And are you liars? Were you lying when you signed your contracts with the Virginia Company? I cringe. Captain Smith is especially angry today. And I know he has gone too far. I have seen how these gentlemen wield their power when they are insulted. Master Wingfield answers Captain Smith in a low growl. You have forgotten your place, Mr. Smith. They should never have sent you gentlemen on this voyage, Captain Smith nearly shouts it. You are all weak, every one of you. You know nothing about survival. Master Wingfield is livid. I think he is about to thrash Captain Smith. I would like to see a fight, but Reverend Hunt steps in. Sick as he is, Reverend Hunt calms Master Wingfield down and talks about how God would want God wants us to bring Christianity to the new world. He somehow makes a fragile peace, somehow convinces the gentleman to wait just a little longer for an east wind. But I know there is no peace inside Master Wingfield. I know it is only a matter of peace inside Master Wingfield, I know it is only a matter of time before he strikes. It will not be with his fists, as we commoners do. It will be with his power, and it will be worse than fists. All right. Our vocabulary off of this chapter is commoner. Commoner is an ordinary person without a rank or title, and I found this picture. A gentleman is a man that was raised in a wealthy family. They usually dress well, and they might be also involved with government a little bit. Slothfulness is you don't want to do any work, like that one boy that was not getting out of bed to do his work. Vocal is using your mouth audibly. And discontent means a dissatisfaction with one's circumstances. And the word that was used quite a few times in this chapter is slop bucket, and that is a portable bathroom pail just like this. We have two discussion questions. I will talk about the first one, and the second one you will answer on Google Classroom. On page 17, Samuel reveals his philosophy, trust no one. What circumstances led him to have that philosophy? And I think Samuel's had a really rough life. He has lost a parent. He has lost his home and had to join the poorhouse. And I think in all of these changes in his life, the only one that he feels he truly can trust is himself because things are always changing. Why would that philosophy be important in the poorhouse, on the streets, or in an orphanage? because he doesn't really know the people and the scenes that are changing around him too well. And with those changing constant scenes, he has found that trusting only himself keeps him safe. Do I think that is a good philosophy? I would think that maybe it's a good philosophy at first, but as you get to know someone or as you get to know a location or an orphanage, that I feel that trust will be built with experience. The longer that you're with someone, the better and trust aspects. Your discussion question is, reread the last paragraph on page 18, and I've provided it also right here. How do you think power can be more damaging than fists?
All right, our historical connection. So, so far in this chapter, in the three chapters, we've covered some actual historical events. In April 1606, James the first of England granted a charter to the Virginia Company to establish colonies in Virginia. The charter named two branches of the company, the Virginia Company of London and the Virginia Company of Plymouth. So there was two different fleets of boats that went out. We're covering with our novel, the Virginia Company of London, but there was also a Virginia Company of Plymouth. In 1606, December 20th, the three ships left. And remember, we've mentioned that the three ships' names were the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery. And they left with a total in history of 105 men and boys to establish a colony in Virginia. And Virginia can be found in the latitude of 34 to 41 degrees. And that's those little marks that you'll see on maps that go up. And I always like to remember latitude like a ladder. Those are the marks that go up this way on a map. Also on April 26, the three ships sighted the land of Virginia. They landed at Cape Henry, the present day Virginia Beach, and were attacked by Indians. So that's soon to come. Back on board, Christopher, sorry, Captain Christopher Newport opened the box containing the names of the seven man council. So once they arrived, they created kind of like their own small government, and that was seven men. The seven men, which you will notice some of these names, are Captain Christopher Newport, Edward Maria Wingfield, Captain Bartholomew Gosnold, Captain John Ratcliffe, Captain John Martin, Captain George Kendall, and John Smith. Wingfield was elected president of the council. And a few days later, they moved into the James River and stopped at what present-day Hampton where the Indians welcomed them. So, I really look forward to continuing this adventure of a novel. Don't forget to answer your discussion question in your Google Classroom. Thank you.